I'm Maya Nicholson, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for March 30th, 2024. On March 17th, Russia concluded its 2024 presidential election, in which Vladimir Putin unsurprisingly won, with support from 87% of voters. This is Putin's fifth term since he came into office in 1999, and this year allegedly won a record number of votes. For today's episode, I chose an episode from April 7th, 2018. In the episode, Alina Polyakova sat down with Vladimir Karamusa to discuss the last so-called Russian election in 2018. They discuss why Putin is so scared of a free election, the poisoning of Sergei Skirpal, the future of Russia under and after Putin, and more. Alina Polyakova, and you're listening to the Lawfare Podcast Special Russia Series, April 7th, 2018. In this episode, I'm joined by Vladimir Karamorza, Vice Chairman of Open Russia and the founder of the Boris Nemtsov Foundation. Vladimir is also a contributing opinion writer for the Washington Post. Vladimir is here to discuss Russia's recent presidential elections, the Skripal poisoning, and the future of Russian democracy after Putin. It's the Lawfare Podcast, episode 299, Vladimir Karamorza on Russia's so-called election. I wanted to start with a recent event that happened in Russia that many people call the Russian presidential elections, and some of us will call a bureaucratic process that was dutifully implemented. You've been involved in Russian politics for a very long time. What are your takeaways from what happened in Russia on March 18th, where Putin received 77 percent of so-called support from the Russian people? Well, you know, it's been said that the surest sign of a genuinely democratic election is when you are certain about the procedure, but not certain about the outcome. That's how elections go in normal democratic countries. In Russia, for years now, for almost two decades, in fact, the model has been the precise opposite. The procedures and the rules and the laws have been shifted all the time to suit the incumbent authorities, while the end result was never in doubt. The event that took place on March 18th in Russia, as you said, at the event that was called the Russian presidential election, I mean, if we're going to use the word election, we have to place it in quotation marks, because uh, that event had as much to do with a genuine democratic contest as the, you know, the brightly painted veneer facades of the Potomkin villages had with real towns and real settlements. On the surface, it seemed that it had some components, you know, that normal elections have. On paper, there was competition, or should I say on veneer. There were eight candidates on the ballot. There were TV debates. There was canvassing. There was, you know, millions of people casting their ballots, vote counting that continued throughout the night. And then it all culminated in the 77% official result for Vladimir Putin that was, of course, immediately hailed by the Kremlin as confirmation of his high support among Russian citizens. But this was only a facade, just like a Potomkin village. And the, the fact is that on so many levels and at, at all the stages of this process, uh, this so-called election was a manipulated and preordained spectacle. Several civil society groups have conducted extensive monitoring of the voting day on March 18th, and our own Open Russia movement was one of those organizations. The others included Golos, the largest independent vote monitoring association in Russia, the Anti-Corruption Foundation, Alexei Navalny's group, and many others. And, of course, there were also international observers present. There was a large mission from the OSCE, from the Organization for for security and cooperation in Europe. And all of those monitors, including our own, have witnessed and documented a whole plethora of abuses and violations, beginning with skewed and biased media coverage to coercion and pressure applied on voters, especially on voters who depend on the state for their subsistence or their employment, people who depend on government employment, municipal employment, teachers, doctors, pensioners who depend on the budget, of course. Many of these people voted in a coerced fashion. They were told not only to go and vote, but they were told for whom to vote, and then they had to report to their bosses by taking a you know cell phone photo or selfie with a ballot paper to show that they voted for the quote-unquote correct candidate. There were multiple instances of ballot stuffing. One of the big concessions that the Kremlin had to give back in 2011 after the mass anti-Putin protest broke out was that they agreed to install web cameras on most of the polling places in Russia so that anybody could log online to the website of the Central Electoral Commission, go to any polling place and see, either watch it live or then download the video and watch the footage. Of course, the problem is that when you don't have a normal judicial system, independent judicial system, which we do not have in Russia. Okay, so you see multiple instances of ballot stuffing and nothing happens. So there were many instances this past month in many regions, people openly coming in and, you know, shoving stacks of ballot papers in the, in the boxes. This was all caught on camera and nothing happened. And then, of course, there was 
as there always has been under Putin in Russian elections, there was mass rewriting of the final vote protocol. So we have, for example, several regions in Russia that have reported, officially reported, Soviet-style 90-plus percent support for Vladimir Putin. Now, I've not met a single person who actually believes those figures reflect the reality, but those are the officially reported figures. And I can go on and on about all the problems and manipulations associated with elections in Russia, but frankly, we don't even need to talk about any of this, because in the most important way, this so-called election was rigged long before the first ballot was even cast, long before before the first polling place was opened. There were two major Russian opposition figures who were planning to run against Vladimir Putin in 2018. One was Boris Nemtsov, former deputy prime minister of Russia, probably the most recognizable face of the democratic opposition. And the other is Alexei Navalny, the prominent anti-corruption activist who spent this past year campaigning all across the country. Neither of them was on the ballot on March 18. Boris Nemtsov, because he was killed three years ago as he walked across a bridge right in front of the Kremlin in Moscow. And Navalny, because he was deliberately barred from running, by a trumped-up, politically motivated court conviction issued by the Russian authorities. It's not difficult to win an election when your opponents are not actually on the ballot. And when people in the West repeat, including well-informed people in the media and the expert community, repeat this Kremlin propaganda lie that Vladimir Putin is so highly popular among Russian citizens. I think it's really worth bearing in mind that this so-called popularity was never actually tested, not once, in a free and fair election against genuine opponents. The question that a lot of people struggle with in the United States and Western countries is that Putin does appear to be quote-unquote genuinely popular with the Russian people. And you're saying, and I agree with you, that we should should take these popularity rankings of 86% and higher, the 77% vote for Putin with a kilo of salt, if not a grain of salt, given the situation in Russia. But you know, is it your sense that Putin is popular among Russian people? And how do we make sense of these numbers? Or other people say that, okay, well, maybe he's not 86% popular, maybe, you know, 50 or 60, but that's still the majority. Maybe there is that 20%. We don't really know. So what's your assessment of what the reality is? Well, to those who say that Vladimir Putin is popular among Russian citizens, I just have one question. Why is such a popular leader so afraid of a free election? Why is he so afraid of letting his people, his citizens, freely choose their government? You know, somebody who has 86% support would not need to rig election after election after election. He would not need to censor the media, keep his opponents off the television screens. He would not need to beat up and arrest peaceful demonstrators. That that is the behavior of, not of somebody who is genuinely popular. That is the behavior of a regime that is weak and insecure. And all this so-called popularity, I mean, look, we we had elections in the Soviet Union as well, in which, you know, there was a 99% official reported turnout, of which 99% voted for the candidates of the bloc of communists and non-party people. Does anybody actually believe that? I mean, there are all the dictatorships of this world, including even North Korea, go through the pretense of holding quote-unquote elections. Putin's regime is, of course, much more clever and creative about this than, you know, the way the Soviets were, or the way, you know, some of the other dictatorships do it. When you came to, you know, in the Soviet Union to, to vote in elections, quote-unquote, you would receive a ballot that would literally have one name on it, and you would receive it, you would put it in a box, and that's how you quote-unquote voted. You know, when Russian citizens came to the polling places on March 18, they received ballots which looked like they had eight names on it. But in essence, in reality, it still had only the one. And I think Grigory Yavlinsky said it actually best when he described the current political system we have in Russia under Vladimir Putin as a postmodern authoritarian regime, as a postmodern dictatorship. The essence is very much the same as what we had in the Soviet times, but the presentation, the facade, the appearance is much more creative and much more intelligent. And so so what those so-called talk shows on state television, they appear to have different viewpoints in them, but this is all pre-staged and this is all fake. And in reality, everybody at the end agrees with the officially sanctioned point of view. And the same with elections. We have, on paper, we have electoral competition, but in reality, we have a dictator who has now been in power for almost two decades. Just think about this. The people, Russian citizens who turned 18 and came to vote for, for the first time in March of this year, were born under Vladimir Putin. This is how long he's been in power. And the way he stayed in power is by artificial officially eliminating competition, by eliminating freedom of the media, by eliminating political pluralism, by keeping his opponents off the ballot, by controlling and manipulating the entire electoral process. It's absolutely meaningless to talk about popularity in this situation. You know, I think it was Dmitry Peskov, Putin's press secretary, who recently said, again in this theme that Putin is so highly popular, he called Vladimir Putin the absolute leader on the political Olympus with whom nobody can seriously compete. That is what Peskov said. Well, on that last point, he was actually right. It is difficult to compete if you are in prison, in exile, or dead. And this is what has been happening to the most prominent opponents of Vladimir Putin. You mentioned the young people who have grown up under Putin. The Economist a couple of 
of weeks ago did this big story on the Putins where they interviewed lots of different young people who have only known Putin and some were very well educated, well traveled, some had never left their towns and villages and held quite contradictory views. You know, they wanted the lifestyle of the West for those that had been there, yet they still voted for Putin. So what is your sense of the youth in Russia today? Well, the only two reliable ways of judging the state of public opinion, one is an election and the other is an opinion poll, right? We already talk about what kind of elections we have in Russia. We, we basically don't uh, in any real sense of the word. And as for opinion polls, I think it's, you know, it's absolutely meaningless to talk about opinion polls in an unfree society, in an authoritarian state where, first of all, a large number of people simply don't have access to objective information because all television is controlled by the state. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, when a lot of people inevitably weigh their response against potential consequences. I mean, it's just a Imagine you sit in your home somewhere in, in Russia and, you know, you know everything that's happening. You know that opponents of Mr. Putin are denounced as traitors and enemies and foreign agents. And then they're arrested. They can be sacked. They can be forced into exile and all the rest of it. And, and, and you know, you get a phone call or a knock on your door. And some person you've never seen before comes in and says, you know, I'm from a polling agency. What do you think of Vladimir Putin? What are you going to say? This is absolutely meaningless. And even according to the Russian opinion polls, about 30 percent of respondents admit that they are afraid to state their honest opinion. And those are only the ones who admit that they're afraid. What about the other one? So we have neither elections nor opinion polls to judge the state of public opinion. Uh, and so it is impossible to answer with any accuracy as to how many, for example, of the young people uh, whom you're asking about are supporters of the current regime. We can only judge from empirical evidence. And the empirical evidence is that over this past year, thousands, tens of thousands of young people have gone out to the streets all across Russia in more than 200 towns and cities to protest against the endemic corruption and the political conditions that have allowed this endemic corruption, you know, the lack of transparency and accountability, the lack of real elections, the lack of major independent media, against the sheer fact that the same person has now stayed in power for almost two decades. These protests took part all over Russia. And this is what makes them different from the latest big protest wave that happened in 2011, 2012. That was mostly concentrated in Moscow and St. Petersburg, as by the way, as you well know, are most major political things in Russia. I mean, all things political in Russia usually happen in Moscow, St. Petersburg. The protest wave that began in March of 2017, so a little more than a year ago, was qualitatively new in that it was truly a national movement. And a second defining characteristic of, of this new protest wave is that it was composed predominantly of the young generation. The vast majority of the protesters who came out, and by the way, you know, to to, to go out to protest against the government in Russia, it's not it's not the same as you know to go and demonstrate against the Trump administration. Is what in Washington here people have freedom of assembly. You go to demonstrate, you're protected by police. In Russia, you're beaten up by police if you go and demonstrate against the government. You you can be sacked from your job, expelled from university. You can be tried and arrested and given a jail sentence for nothing, as many people have been. And and in those conditions, tens of thousands of young people have gone to the streets all across Russia to protest against against this regime and its policies. And I think, frankly, those are the people who have grown up under Putin. Many were born under Putin. None of them have, or at least most of them don't, don't have any memories of any other political reality except Vladimir Putin. And yet it is representatives of that generation, if you want to call it the Putin generation, who are increasingly saying enough, who are increasingly turning against the system. And I think, frankly, this is a very worrying sign for the present regime. I'd certainly be worried if I were them, but I think it's a very hopeful and very promising sign for the future of Russia. You've mentioned a couple of times the 2011-2012 protests, the so-called Balotnaya protests that happened in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Why do you think that this time during the elections, we saw protests in the year leading up, but not during the elections themselves? Well, I think, of course, 2011, in December of 2011, we had the so-called parliamentary election that was massively and blatantly rigged. And it wasn't the first Russian election that was rigged. I mean, this, if, if we look at the, for example, at the reports from the OSCE observers from international observers who have monitored Russian elections as part of our membership obligations under the OSCE, you will see that they have assessed every national election in Russia after the year 2000 as not free or not fair. We have not had a really genuine democratic election since at least 2000, maybe even before. That's debatable, but definitely none since 2000. So 2011 was not the first Russian election that was rigged, but it was the first that was rigged so blatantly and so brazenly, just in the face of everybody. And also, of course, this was already the cell phones and Twitter and Facebook and social media. So you have you had these images of ballot stuffing and vote rigging, you know, within minutes spread all across the country, again, especially among the young generation. And so because this was done so brazenly and so in your face, this caused such a huge public outcry back in 2011. Now, everybody knew this so-called election would be rigged and manipulated. In fact, as we've just discussed, it was rigged and manipulated in advance when the two major opponents who wanted to run against Putin were prevented from. One because he's dead and the other because he was barred. So we have seen, as, as you pointed out correctly, we've seen kind of the reverse model this time. We had the protests 
before the so-called election rather than after. But, you know, let's see what happens in the, in the coming months and years. One thing we do know about election history is that it can definitely throw a few political surprises. And if we go back to 2011, nobody, and I can speak as a participant of the events, no one, at least on our side, and I don't think certainly on the Kremlin side, also expected. You know, for example, in September 2011, when Putin and Medvedev announced their so-called castling, their, their job swap, if anybody told me then that three months from now, there will be 100,000 people standing in the middle of Moscow protesting against Putin, I would have thought that person's living in a cloud cuckoo land because, you know, for years, we were lucky to get a few hundred people at an opposition rally and, have, and suddenly you had 100,000. So this is how things usually happen in Russia. So let's see what happens in the coming months. It does seem to me there was some sort of shift that happened where you talk about the one reason why in 2011, 2012, the protests erupted and they were so much larger than anybody had expected was because of how brazen the, the fraudulent rigging was of the elections. And of course, now you mentioned 2018, it was even more brazen, right? It wasn't just on social media that people were taking photos and sharing. I mean, there were 24-hour cameras that just blatantly showed people showing up polling stations with like packs of ballots, just, you know, shoving them into the boxes. And everybody saw this. It was in plain sight. And even the state, you know, they broadcast this. So what what has shifted? Like, why was this time not enough or it didn't really incite people to be upset about what was happening? Is it that the nature of what people are reacting to has changed? Is it really about corruption now more so anything that gets people? You know, I'm just trying to understand, you know, what has happened in those in those six, seven years? I think it's the fact that, you know, back six, seven years ago, some people maybe still had some illusions about being able to achieve change through the electoral mechanisms, however imperfect and manipulated they were already then. Now, I think most people in Russia, at least most of the kind of politically active and politically aware people, realize that the electoral process has become completely devoid of any meaning, of any substance, and that, you know, nothing can be done through it. And there's actually a very deep irony in this, because for many years, the Kremlin has been signaling that it's its biggest fear, its biggest nightmare, if you want, is the type of scenario that we saw in many other post-communist countries like Serbia and Georgia and Ukraine. It's a scenario when, you know, change happens when masses of people go out to the streets to protest. Well, sometimes they're called color revolutions, right? It's happened again in these post-communist countries. And, and this has been the Kremlin's biggest, biggest nightmare. They've been saying it themselves. I mean, uh, they've set up groups and organizations like NASHI to combat this supposed threat. They've accused, you know, us, opposition leaders, of cahooting with Western governments to, to kind of prepare such a scenario in, in Russia. Putin openly, just a few months ago, compared Alexei Navalny to Mikhail Saakashvili, the leader of the Rose Revolution in Georgia, the former president of Georgia. When he was actually asked the question, why is Navalny not allowed to run as candidate for president? He didn't refer to this so-called court conviction that is the official reason for Navalny not being. He said because he's like Saakashvili. So he openly admitted the political nature of the, of the disenfranchisement on Navalny. So this has been kind of the constant theme of the Kremlin, the constant kind of fear that they've had. And yet the irony, of course, here is that if anybody is preparing such a scenario in Russia, it is the people who have destroyed elections as an institution. Because if you destroy the normal constitutional electoral mechanisms of changing the government, then you leave no other way except the street. And nothing is forever. I mean, as much as Mr. Putin may think he's there forever, he's not. Nothing is and nobody is. And so by doing what they're doing, by eliminating all the normal political processes in the country, Country, by muzzling the media, by rigging elections, by, you know, keeping their opponents away from the legal and official political process, the Kremlin is ensuring that whenever the next big political changes happen in Russia, they will happen very likely through a street-based scenario rather than through the ballot. So now looking ahead in, in the very near term, the protests we've been talking about this began in 2017, uh, were in many ways the response to Alexei Navalny being able to, to mobilize these protests around the anti-corruption cause. Some of the videos that he's produced exposed the corruption by government officials like Prime Minister Medvedev have been watched millions and millions of times on YouTube. And this also seems to be a threat, meaning an open online space where people like Navalny can be, become popular video bloggers in a way subvert the official state-funded media, which dominates the media landscape in Russia today. But, you know, how much longer do you think that he and other members of the Russian opposition will be able to maintain that momentum? It seems to me that now priority number one, if I was Putin, would be to shut down YouTube. And they've already tried to do that with Navalny, to shut down his YouTube channel, to try to shut down the online information space in the same way that they've shut down the traditional media and space. So it seems to me that they're going to go after this much more aggressively now and for the next years to come. So what is the potential for actually reaching the Russian population? What do you think are the avenues to try to get people to understand what's happening in their country in terms of corruption, in terms of their declining living standards, and who's truly responsible? 
responsible for this. I don't think they will be able, even if they wanted to, by they I mean the, I mean the Russian authorities, I don't think they will be able to do what, for example, the Chinese authorities have done with the internet. It's too late for that, frankly. The way internet censorship began in China is, you know, the censorship began when the internet began. And so internet was small, they began censoring it straight away, and then as the internet grew, so did the censorship. And it was kind of, for most people in China, this was kind of the accepted norm. That's that's how they saw internet from the beginning. In Russia, today we have, you know, two-thirds to three-quarters of the population, and if you take the big cities, that's 80-90% who are daily internet users. Tens of millions of people. And our internet is largely free. And it is not possible to just shut it all off in a second or even in a day or even in a week. I mean, I, I want to see them try. They are trying in kind of incremental ways. For example, all of the websites that are operated by my organization, Open Russia, have been officially blocked and officially banned by the order of the Russian prosecutor general last year. But, you know, I'm somebody who is a complete technical cretin. I don't know the first thing about technology. It takes me, when I'm in Moscow, on my iPhone, 30 seconds to open any of the quote-unquote blocked websites. It is really easy. As you know, the Russian people are very creative that way. And, uh, you know, whatever the Kremlin is trying to do in this regard, uh, frankly, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And you're absolutely right right, in that there is this new alternative information space that is completely outside the regime's control. I mean, we've been used traditionally to thinking, when we thought about the media space, we thought about mostly national television, because for years that was the main source of information, and still continues to be, for now, the main source of information for the majority of, of Russian citizens. But now we have this entire alternative space that is growing, that is important, that is significant, that is completely beyond the, the control and the censorship of the Kremlin. And the example of this investigation that you just gave, you know, a year ago, the investigation by Navalny's anti-corruption foundation, foundation into the secret financial empire of Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, showing all his assets, his villas, his mansions, his yachts, his, you know, vineyards in Italy and all the rest of it. A lot of sneaker shoes for some reason, as you recall. Of course, you know, needless to say, if you watched any of the state television channels, you would not hear a single word about this investigation. And the only way you would ever hear about Navalny is, is, is as an American agent or something like this. And yet more than 25 million people in Russia watched this Navalny investigation through YouTube, through Facebook, through Twitter, through Contacted, uh, the main Russian social media and other online platforms, more than 25 million people and, and tens of thousands of people as a result of that went to, to the streets to protest, which was the first wave, the first kind of ignition spark of those protests a year ago. So there is this entire universe of information that is outside the Kremlin's control. And frankly, I don't think there's anything they can they will be able to do about that. You mentioned Boris Nemtsov already. And previously in the podcast, as you know, we talked to his daughter, Jana Nemtsova, right around the time that here in Washington, D.C., we we had the opening of Boris Nemtsov Plaza in front of the, the Russian embassy. And you were there, you were deeply involved in advocating for the United States to do this. You're a Russian citizen. I think you said yourself that you're a Russian patriot before. Why was it important to have the Boris Nemtsov Plaza in Washington, D.C.? And you've also been involved with other efforts, most importantly, the Magnitsky Act and the Global Magnitsky Act, which passed in the United States in 2013 and is now being passed by other European countries. And you've been also involved in, I think, very effective uh, pushing European governments towards passing global Magnitsky. Why is this important to you? Russia is a country of symbols. And the astonishing fact is that the Kremlin, the Putin regime, has been fighting against Boris Nemtsov even after he was killed. They never stopped fighting him, except they're now fighting his name and his memory and his legacy. They have blocked and rejected and stopped you know, all public initiatives for any kind of commemoration for Boris Nemtsov, for a Russian statesman. We're not allowed to honor and commemorate a Russian statesman in Russia. They said when the Moscow city government rejected a petition to, to have a memorial sign on that bridge where he was killed, they said, this was three years ago, they said, there's no consensus on this in society and so we are rejecting it. So apparently we're supposed to believe that there was consensus for naming a street in Moscow after Hugo Chavez, the late Venezuelan dictator, which we have. There was apparently consensus for naming a street in Moscow after Ahmad Kadyrov, the Kremlin-appointed strongman in Chechnya, who had once declared a jihad against Russia and who called on his followers to, quote, kill as many Russians as possible, end of quote. There was no problem with consensus for naming a street in Moscow after that guy. But for a Russian statesman, a four-term member of parliament, deputy prime minister, regional governor, he's a no-go. And, you know, there have been many unofficial memorials to him all over the country. Of course, when he was killed, tens of thousands of people marched through the streets of Moscow in remembrance. And to this day, uh, uh, there is this makeshift, unofficial memorial to him on the bridge where he was killed, where people still continue to bring flowers and candles and, and put up pictures. And the Moscow authorities regularly come to that bridge in the middle of the night, several times a month, and steal away those flowers and the candles and the pictures, the pillage and destroy. They try to kill the memory. And we wanted to show that you cannot kill the memory. You can kill a human being, but you cannot kill memory and you cannot kill the principles he stood for. And so we decided that since we are not 
allowed to honor and commemorate a Russian statesman in Russia. Let's do this where we can. Let's do this in free countries. And we're deeply grateful to citizens and to elected representatives in, in free countries, first and foremost here in Washington, D.C., who have stepped in to do what we could not. And as you mentioned, on February 27 of this year, the third anniversary of the assassination of Boris Nemtsov, we came here to Washington to officially unveil Boris Nemtsov Plaza in front of the Russian embassy in Washington. Uh, this is the first official commemoration for Boris Nemtsov anywhere in the world. And it was made possible with the support uh, of leaders of both parties on Capitol Hill, in both houses of the U.S. Congress, and most of all with the support from the authorities in the District of Columbia, the council and the mayor of the District of Columbia, who have actually passed and effected this legislation to make it possible. And, and actually just a few days before we unveiled Boris Nemtsov Plaza here in Washington, the Moscow city government has announced that it will be reversing its position. And after three years of blocking all initiatives, it will finally allow the installation of a small memorial plaque on the building on the apartment block where Boris Nemtsov lived. They've apparently realized how it looks when, you know, the U.S. capital is honoring a Russian statesman and the Russian capital is refusing to do so. So we now have Boris Nemtsov Plaza in Washington. It was a very moving, very touching ceremony. We had several members of Congress who, who helped us on this initiative. Of course, Jana came and, and she was she, she joined you for this podcast as well. Uh, Raisa, Boris Nemtsov's first wife, came and the other friends and colleagues. And um, my younger daughter, who is Boris Nemtsov's goddaughter, she pulled the string to officially unveil the sign. And I said at that unveiling, and I'm happy to repeat this here, that, you know, in 1984 when the authorities here in Washington, D.C. decided to rename a block in front of what was then the Soviet embassy after Andrei Sakharov, uh, of course, the legendary Soviet dissident. As we can all imagine, the Soviet government was not pleased. Seven years later, there was a Sakharov Avenue in Moscow, and there was no longer a Soviet government. Russian history has a way of changing like that. And uh, whatever the people in the Kremlin think today, you know, to me, as a Russian citizen, there can be nothing more patriotic than to name a street in front of the Russian embassy after a Russian statesman. And whatever the people in the Kremlin think of this today, I know that there will come a day when the Russian state will be proud that our embassy here in Washington is standing on a street named after Boris Nemtsov. You've also said, I've heard you say a few times, that Boris Nemtsov, when he was alive, referred to the Magnitsky Act as the most pro-Russian legislation. Why did he say that? Well, he was, of course, himself, Boris Nemtsov was instrumental in, in convincing members of Congress to pass the Magnitsky Act. This was done, as we all remember, over the opposition from the then U.S. administration. And he came here several times. He met with leaders of both parties in, in Congress, and I was there at those meetings with him. I saw him do this and saw him talk to them, explain to them why this is so important. And on the day the Magnitsky uh, bill was being voted on in, in the U.S. House of Representatives, this was November 16, 2012, the third anniversary of the death of Sergei Magnitsky, Boris and I were sitting in the visitor's gallery in the U.S. House of Representatives chamber watching them vote on this bill. And, and it was then that Boris Nemtsov said that this is the most pro-Russian law ever passed in any foreign country because it targets the people, it holds to account the people who steal from Russian citizens through corruption and who abuse the rights of Russian citizens. And of course, the premise of the Magnitsky Act, it does not impose sanctions on Russia. It does not impose sanctions on the Russian people, the Russian state, or even the Russian government. It imposes personal targeted individual sanctions on people, specific people, who are involved based on credible evidence in corruption and human rights violations. And so it introduces the accountability that we for now do not have in our own country because, you know, corruption is, is an integral part of the system uh, of, of uh, the regime that we have in Russia today. The human rights abuses are an integral part of the system that we have in Russia today. Not, these are not problems. They're part of the system. And the people who are involved in human rights abuses, they are at the same time the people who are supposed to protect the law. I mean, I'll give you just one specific example. This, this is an individual who is now officially designated under the U.S. Magnitsky Act as a human rights abuser. And for years, we have pushed and pressed the U.S. authorities to do this with regard to the specific individual. His name is General Alexander Bastrykin. He's the chairman of the investigative committee of the Russian Federation, so the equivalent of the FBI. This is a top law enforcement agency in the Russian government. So this person has been responsible for every politically motivated prosecution of the last several years. The Navalny case, the Yukos case, the Balotna case, of course the Magnitsky case itself, many other politically motivated prosecutions of opposition activists. But he did more than that. A few years ago, about five or six years ago, he personally, and again, this is the top law enforcement official in Russia, a general, he personally drove a leading independent journalist, Sergei Sakalov, deputy editor-in-chief of Novaya Gazeta, to a forest near Moscow, took him out of the car, walked him into the forest and said, if your newspaper continues to publish what you're publishing, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to bury you right here in this forest. And by the way, 
haha, I'm going to be in charge of the investigation because I'm the head of the investigative committee. And this is not on dispute. He admitted doing this. This is not allegedly or supposedly. And for years, you know, the US government would not sanction him. And finally, they did. And since last year, he has been designated as a human rights abuser under the Magnitsky Act. And of course, those are the types of people that this law is, is, is made for, or I should say made against. These are the people who enjoy the positions of power, including in the law enforcement community, but who themselves are the worst kind of human rights abusers and perpetrators of corruption and human rights violations against the people of Russia. And so because we are not able to have this accountability inside of our country, we feel it is important to have it at least on the international level. And the reason it is so important, of course, is because, you know, the nature of the current regime in Russia is such that those people, the officials and the oligarchs around the Putin regime, who are responsible for violating and attacking and undermining the most basic norms of democracy and the rule of law in Russia, themselves want to enjoy the privileges and the perks of Western countries that have democracy and the rule of law, because it's in the West that they send their children to schools, that they keep, uh, you know, their money in the bank account, their money, the money they've stolen from the Russian people. It's in the West that they buy houses and yachts and villas and mansions and all the rest of it, keeps their wives and their mistresses. And so, you know, for years, these people have been accustomed to stealing in Russia, but spending in the West. And of course, this constitutes a phenomenal hypocrisy on their part, on the part of Western countries. In our view, this constitutes enabling, because, you know, if you welcome the perpetrators of corruption and human rights abuses in Russia on your soil and in your banks, then you are in effect enabling human rights abuses and corruption in Russia. And this needs to stop. And the Magnitsky Act has at least begun to put a stop to this because it in in introduced this very simple principle that those people who are responsible for these corrupt practices and for these human rights abuses will no longer be able to receive visas on assets or use the banking and financial systems of these countries. There are now, as of today, there are five countries that have passed a full-fledged Magnitsky law. The US, of course, was the first one, and it was followed by Canada and the three Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And we are continuing to work with other democratic nations to convince them to pass similar legislation. And just a few weeks ago, I was in Copenhagen to meet with members of the Danish parliament. Hopefully, we're going to get the ball rolling there soon. I'm going to be at the end of this month, I'm going to be in London to testify the British parliament in support of, of similar measures in, in the United Kingdom. And we hope that more of the world's democracies take a principled stand and send a message that the crooks and the human rights abusers will no longer be welcome here. You mentioned the UK. And of course, we've all been shocked and taken aback with the Russian government's decision to assassinate Sergei Skripal and his daughter on British soil by releasing this nerve agent, Novichok, that infected a broader part of the population. The British government has been very clear that this was an attack orchestrated by the Russian government and likely came from Mr. Putin himself. You yourself have been the target of the Russian government's strategic campaign to assault, assassinate any sort of voices of opposition. It's, it's on there on public record, as you said, that you twice have now been poisoned and found yourself in very dire medical condition. All of us are, of course, grateful that you're doing well now. But as everyone's thinking about the Skripal case, and now there seems to be a serious conversation in the United Kingdom about how to respond, you're going there to talk about the Magnus Gag, something that they haven't passed. We often hear one other name associated with Skripal, which is Litvinenko, who is the former Russian intelligence officer who was living in the UK and was poisoned with polonium in 2006. And Theresa May was a minister of the interior in the time, and the British government did nothing, even though 10 years later, there was a report that very clearly pointed the blame at the Russian government. And now we have the Skripal case, and the response seems to be very different. Are these the, the two cases we should be thinking about? Have there been others that have been affected in similar ways that we don't hear about so much in, in the Western media? And why do you think now the British government seems likely to go after the Russian dirty money on British soil. Well, you know, there's a saying, better late than never. And you mentioned the Litvinenko case in 2006. It took Marina Litvinenko, Alexander Litvinenko's widow, nine years to go basically through the entire British judicial system to force the hand of the British government to force it to actually have this public inquiry, which you referenced, which concluded in 2016 that it was likely an operation approved by, by Mr. Putin himself. It, you know, the reason we have this report of this inquiry is not because the British government wanted to have it is because Marina Litvinenko forced them to do it. And now, recently, with, you know, as part of now of this Skripal investigation, the British government announced that it will review, I believe it was 14, 1, 4, suspicious deaths of, of Russian citizens on UK soil in the last several years. Where, where were they before? I mean, it's, it's just a simple fact that there has been, for some reason, a strangely high mortality rate among the people who have in one way or another crossed the path of the Putin regime, not just former intelligence or security officers like Mr. Litvinenko uh, and, and others, but also, of course, and most prominently uh, 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 people like independent
independent journalists, civil society activists, opposition leaders. We talked already about Boris Nemtsov. This was the most high profile, the most brazen political assassination in modern Russia. And and there have been other cases that were maybe less talked about, but that point in a similar direction. Um, and many of them were actually done uh, by poisoning, by the method that, you know, now is apparently the case in the UK. For example, you know, Anna Politkovska, the journalist from Nova Gazeta, who was killed in 2006, shot to death in her apartment building two years before she was shot to death. She was also poisoned on her way to the Beslan terrorist siege when she was on the way to cover there. She was she barely survived. She was in hospital a year earlier in 2003. Perhaps the best known anti-corruption uh, journalist investigator in Russia, Yuri Shikachikhin, who was a member of the, uh, he was an opposition member of parliament and he was deputy editor-in-chief of Nova Gazeta, the same newspaper where Anna Politkovska worked. He died in the summer of 2003. His autopsy was classified and the official cause of death was given as Lyell syndrome. Well, Lyell syndrome is a really rare and strange disease that affects something like one in four million people. I mean, what are the chances of it suddenly affecting the most high-profile anti-corruption investigating journalists in Russia? This, um, his friends and colleagues have no doubt that this was deliberate poisoning. Uh, another case was uh, Viktor Yushchenko, the Ukrainian presidential candidate during 2004. Ukrainian presidential campaign, he thankfully survived, but he was disfigured and he still feels the effects of this. You, you mentioned me. I'm certainly very happy to be sitting here and speaking with you today. I've, 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 I've had to deal with, spo- with poisoning twice in 2015 and again last year and both times went into a coma with multiple organ failure and both times doctors told my wife that I had about a 5% chance to survive. So I really mean this when I say that I'm happy to, to be here and sitting here and speaking with you. But many other people have been less fortunate and of course the vast majority of those attacks obviously took place in Russia but I have to say that the United Kingdom came a close second and there has been a whole slate of suspicious deaths of Russian citizens on British soil in the past years and you know Litvinenko is just one of them. There were others. Uh, for example, Alexander Prepelichny, the whistleblower in the Magnitsky case. You know, a healthy 44-year-old man went out jogging one day and dropped dead. And, and the British police, again, refused initially to open even a, a murder investigation. Now, again, they're being pressed into doing an inquest, and, and, and which is underway now. But this has been happening for years. And frankly, I think had there been any kind of reaction earlier, maybe we would not be seeing this again and again and again. But because the British government effectively did nothing in, in these previous cases, we see we see that this is continuing and again better late than never and let's hope that at least now they take some measures to protect both themselves and to protect those Russian citizens who are residing uh, on their territory. Uh, you mentioned an organization that you're now involved with called Open Russia. I want to get you to talk a little bit more about this organization, what it does, and also your vision for what you hope will be Russia's future. I think you're obviously someone who has to be optimistic. Otherwise, if you're cynical, if you're pessimistic, I can't imagine being as engaged and involved as you are in some of the efforts that we've been talking about. So, you know, what what is Open Russia and, you know, what's your hope for, for the future of your country? Open Russia is a pro-democracy movement. It's, it's a national platform that unites people who believe in a very different future for Russia than the one represented by the current regime, who believe in a, in a future for Russia based on the rule of law, based on democratic election, based on respect for the rights of our own citizens. And the main focus of our work is, in fact, on the young generation. And it, the main focus of our work is on actually preparing for that future change and for that future transition that will come after Vladimir Putin. We do not know precisely when or how it will happen, but we do know that it will because nothing is forever. And, you know, speaking as a historian myself, I can certainly say that, uh, you know, modern Russian history shows us that big political changes in our country can start happening suddenly, quickly and unexpectedly. Just think back to 1905 or 1917 or 1991, something in my living memory when, you know, a regime that had stood for decades went down in three days as the Soviet regime did in August 1990. And but but of course the flip side of that sudden change is that nobody's prepared, and so many mistakes are made, and so many mistakes were made in the 90s, not through any bad intentions necessarily, but be, just because people were not prepared for the for the task. And it's difficult to be prepared when power falls on your hands in three days, right? And when that change starts happening, it's too late to sit down and f- start figuring out what okay, what do we do now? We have to prepare for that today, and this is what we're doing. And there are two main ways in which we're doing this. So one way is to actually work and discuss and deliberate on some of the substance for those future reform proposals. For example, we have several working groups under the auspices of Open Russia that are uh, discussing and, and, and publishing specific proposals in spe- specific areas and what will need to be changed after Putin. We've had reports published about energy sector reform, about the demonopolization of the Russian economy, about constitutional reform, a very important point. There's a growing consensus within the Russian opposition
position, certainly in our movement, that whatever comes after Putin will we'll need to have a much more balanced, much more parliamentary rather than presidential system. It has not worked out well in Russia with one person holding all the levers of power. That's certainly a, a conclusion that's shared by an increasing number of people. And the second way in which we are preparing for that future transition, for that post-Putin transition, is by actually helping to train and educate the people who will be in charge of that transition, the young generation, those young pro-democracy activists and civil society activists who are going out to the streets, who are becoming increasingly involved in the in civil society, in the opposition movement. We want to help empower them and support them and, and help them become at least a little bit more prepared than they are today for that future task. And one of the ways we're doing this is by actually using elections, even in light of what they had become in Russia today, not free, not fair, not democratic, we know all of that. But we still feel we can use this as, if you will, as a training ground to go through that process, to help people go through that process and gain the skills and the experience of political campaigning, of civic activism, of organizing on local issues. And since Open Russia was launched in 2014, so almost four years now, we have run dozens of candidates in elections all across the country on the municipal, regional, and national level. We have built and organized campaigns around them. So to help people uh, be candidates, be campaign managers, be campaign volunteers, because even if they cannot win, which is almost, you know, that's almost impossible today, but they can still learn. They can still learn the skills. They can still learn how to speak to people, how to walk door to door, how to organize on local issues and publish leaflets and newspapers and speak at rallies and so on and so forth. And admittedly, it's difficult to, you know, to prepare for democratic governance under an authoritarian system, right? That's not the best tools you can think of. But, you know, we're using what tools and what instruments we have. And I think the people who are, who are involved in our training and educational projects are the wiser for it. And I always compare this with, you know, there was a famous Soviet pianist uh, in the mid 20th century, Rudolf Kerrer. Uh, he was an ethnic German. So when the war began in 1941, he was exiled along with his family to Kazakhstan. And he spent 13 years in that internal exile, living somewhere in a wooden barracks in the middle of the steppes. And, uh, you know, needless to say, he didn't have a piano there with him. So he took out a plank of wood and a knife and he carved out a pretend keyboard on that plank of wood and he would practice on it every day just so his fingers wouldn't forget and he did this for 13 years and then in the 50s he was able to return back to Moscow he went on to become a soloist of the Moscow Philharmonic he taught at the Moscow Conservatoire he won the USSR musical soloist competition in 1962 he's one of the most accomplished pianists of his time and for 13 years he had practiced on a plank of wood this is what we're doing today we are helping that young generation to prepare for the time when they will be building a new Russia after Vladimir Putin Vladimir thank you so much for that inspirational message and for joining us on the podcast. Great to be here. Thank you so much. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Special thanks this week to Vladimir for joining us. As a reminder, you can read his views on the Washington Post. And if you haven't yet, please share the Lawfare Podcast on Facebook, tweet about it, give it a high rating and review it wherever you listen to us. Our music, as always, is performed by Sophia Yen. And thanks for listening. I'm Alina Poyakova.